Hello. 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 Okay, let's get started. Okay, you see some flowers in front of you. These are these are roses from my front yard. If you get to know me, you'll know that I absolutely love flowers and I love color even more, as you can see. <laughs> I thought it was an appropriate picture. This is a good little study. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, one thing came out of it that I did not know going into this study when I started out. And uh, it's going to show you the importance of looking at the Hebrew words. I've heard so many times, oh, I don't need to know the Hebrew. Oh, I don't need to have that. I have my English versions and they're good enough for me. I just have to read. <laughs> Do we just have to read? Yes, we are told to read the scriptures. But Yahuwah says if we're to do something, we're to do it with all our heart. So is just reading, doing it with all our heart? What about breaking it apart, taking the words down to their root words in the Hebrew and studying them, <clears throat> getting to know their definitions? So I think, I think this PowerPoint coming up here is going to show you the importance of digging a little bit deeper than just to the English words that we read every day. So I hope everybody enjoys this and I pray that everybody is blessed. Laban's quenched rage confirms creation. And this is from Genesis 31. So what will Laban's rage show us about creation? What is the connection here? And this is a teaching from Yah's Covenant Calendar and I hope you will visit our website it's at studythecalendar.com, where there are many, many, many PowerPoints and incredible amount of information there to go through. And I'm quite positive you will be blessed if you put in your time to look at the materials that's provided there. A spiritual darkness reveals Yahusha's dawn to dawn light dawn to dawn as written in genesis 1 that's where it begins and that is where it is carried through the scriptures yahushua himself lived out dawn to dawn not just in his life but in his death also so that's why dawn to dawn is so incredibly important <laughs> laban's blindness reveals yahushua's light it was this blind ambition which plainly laid out Yahuwah's cycle schedule set forth at creation. Genesis 31. There were speckled and streaked blessings, brilliantly exposing the start of Yahuwah's cycles and his shane. For those that do not understand the word shane, that is the Hebrew word for year. The first time you will see that is in Genesis 1.14. That word shane is used 873 times in the Tanakh. Is it important? 873 times. 800 of those times, it's direct reference to the year. So yes, it is important. Yahuwah caused Yaakov, or Jacob, to be very prosperous while serving his father-in-law Laban. That very blessing aroused agitating friction among the sons of Laban, and they suggested to Laban that Yaakov was taking advantage of the situation. Laban, who served gods made by human hands, was highly susceptible to their influence. He initially disregarded that Yaakov served the Elohim of hosts, Tseva Ot, the one and only Almighty. Laban had become agitated towards Yaakov. And then we read Genesis 31.3. And Yahuwah said to Yaakov, Return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I am with you. Note that there is a command, and Yahuwah says, I am with you. I will be there. I will walk beside you. I will protect you. And I will lead you through what you have to go through. I will be with you. <laughs> Yaakov gathered his family and explained to them how it was that Yahuwah caused the livestock to flourish in colorful vacations, creating a separate and fully distinguishable flock from that of Laban and his family. This factor birthed the contention between Yaakov 
and Laban's family. Cute little lamb on the right there, speckled, spotted, and streaked they were. And I believe that Yahuwah did this specifically to bless Yaakov. What caused the hard sentiment in this event? And the messenger of Elohim spoke to me in a dream, saying, Yaakov. And I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift your eyes now and see. All the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the El of Beth El, where you anointed the standing column, and where you made a vow to me. Now, rise up, get out of this land, and return to the land of your relatives. And Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Do we still have any portion or inheritance in our father's house? Are we not reckoned by him as strangers? For he has sold us and also entirely consumed our silver. For all the wealth which Elohim has taken from our father are ours and our children's. Now then, do whatever Elohim has told you. So Yahweh was and put his children and his wives on camels, and he drove off all his livestock and all his possessions which he had acquired. His property of the livestock, which he had acquired in Paddan Aram, to his in the land of Canaan. And for those that are not familiar with Yitzhak, that is Isaac. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Genesis 31, 19. And when Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel stole the house idols that were her father's. And Yaakov deceived Laban the Aramean because he did not inform him that he was about to flee. And he fled with all that he had, and he rose up and passed over the river and headed toward the mountains of Gilad. And on the third day, Laban was told that Yaakov had fled. <clears throat> now I want you to note this third day. And I have uh, emphasized this specifically for others that are studying. Uh, if I want to relate this to the wedding in Cana on the third day, we see this in the, in the New Testament. That third day was the third day of the year. That is a proven fact. It was the third day of the year. And I can show you this if you inquire. And I'm, my question to you today is, is this third day... Is this also the third day of the year? Now, I, I haven't proven this. This is something that I'm thinking of, and I would like each one to uh, think about this, what people that are searching. And there's a reason why I'm talking about this third day, and you're going to see it a little bit later. I'm going to talk about this again. And I'm going to read it again. And on the third day, Laban was told that Yaakov had fled. Laban was justifiably upset that his offspring had left without notice. The flocks in contention were removed, and most importantly to Laban, his gods of wood and stone had vanished at the same time. Laban was hot with anger at being deceived and had full intentions of bringing forth justice of his own determination. How do we know this? Then he took his brothers with him and pursued him for seven days journey and he overtook him into the mountains of Gilad here is this seven days journey and this relates closely to the three days until Laban was informed of Yaakov's departure if in fact this is the or that was the third day of the year and this seven days journey was added to that this might bring us to a Bib 10. This is just my thoughts right now, and I'm putting this out for those who would like to search this. If this is indeed a Bib 10, <clears throat> isn't that the day that the lamb was chosen? And the reason I'm asking this is, are we going to see that Yahuwah chose his lamb, that being Yaakov, on this day? Just a thought, and I'm putting it out there for those that would like to search this. <clears throat> this was an intense chase, 
please note that Yahuwah knew very well of Laban's deeper evil intentions. Genesis 31, 24. But in a dream by night, Elohim came to Laban the Aramean and said to him, Guard yourself that you do not speak to Yaakov, either good or evil. He was to be neutral. Note carefully this, this dream by night, H 3915 Leil, it was in the night season. The timing of this dream will become paramount for understanding Yahuwah's seven dawn-to-dawn -dawn cycles, which formulate a completed week. The time frame of Yahuwah's communication in a dream to Laban. It was in the night. That word is H3915 Leil. Night, night as opposed to day. Now to read the narration that took place between Laban and Yaakov, Genesis 31, 25. Then Laban overtook Yaakov. Now Yaakov had pitched his tent in the mountains, and Laban with his brothers pitched in the mountains of Gilad. And Laban said to Yaakov, What have you done that you have deceived me and driven my daughters off like captives taken with the sword? Why did you flee secretly and deceive me and not inform me? And I would have sent you away with joy and songs, with tambourine and lyre. Or lyre, however you want to say that word, I'm not quite sure. But here Laban is saying that it would have been a party. He would have sent them away happily. Are we going to see that later on? I want you to question that right now. Question Laban's words. Verse 28. And you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Now you have been foolish to do this. Laban speaks directly to Yaakov. Verse 29a. It is in the power of my hand to do evil to you. But the Elohim of your father spoke to me. Notice he said the Elohim of your father. Laban knew who Yahuwah was. Laban, who had sunk into idol worship, understood clearly exactly who Yahuwah is. Further on, Laban did show a good measure of respect for the Elohim of Yaakov. Laban knew he could physically overpower and destroy Yaakov. Yet because Laban had witnessed the power of Yahuwah through the prosperity in numbers of Yaakov's flock, Laban knew he had best listened to the dream given to him. It would probably be in his best interest if he wanted to live. When did Yahuwah speak to Laban? If we look down, you'll see there's the dawn. That is the, what separates the night from the light that separates the 24-hour days, and it was in the light season that Laban related Yahuwah's dream factor to Yaakov. It was in this light season. Let's read it. It is in the power of my hand to do evil to you, but the Elohim of your father spoke to me last night. Very important words here. This is very crucial to understand. Yahuwah gave the dream to Laban in the previous night season. That word for last night is H570 Emesh. If we look at the Geneva, the KGV, and Bishop's scriptures, you will see that that word Emesh was originally translated as yesternight. Today we do not hear that word because it is what they classify as archaic. But the meaning of that word is extremely important. Laban and Yaakov were speaking in the light season immediately following the H3915 night season of the dream. How do we know this? Let's look at the Hebrew word for yesternight. This is taken out of the BLB. We see the word there, emesh, on the left. 
And if we look where that star emphasis is, we can see that it was translated as yesternight, originally. Yesternight. This is taken again from the Blue Letter Bible online app. And notice that the word emesh was originally translated as yesternight. Here is Strong's definitions. Time passed, yesterday, or last night. Now note in that box, it says former time. That cannot be inclusive. That is exclusive, former time. That means there has been a cutoff period at that point, at some point. Where is that point? That's what we need to determine. And uh, Jesenius has more information here. Let's uh, look at the blue lines. It, it denotes the latter part of the previous natural day, yesternight, the previous part. And here he illustrates and compares more on Imesh. And we are to compare this with to do at evening and as used of tomorrow in the morning and tomorrow there has there is a separation point between these between the evening and between the morning it is tomorrow it is a different period number two night and darkness generally this is a mesh the orientals well compare a pathless desert to night and darkness. What does the Hebrew look like? This is taken from the interlinear scripture analyzer. This is the word Amesh. And if you look at that golden arrow that identifies the correct Hebrew letters, there's a, they're a little different style, different script, but they are the exact same letters. And this is taken from a Hebrew lexicon by John, Park, John Parkhurst from 1762. What I do like about this lexicon is it does not use the Masoretic vowel points. It dis, it, they, well, they're just not used, and I appreciate that. Amesh, what is his take on Amesh? To recede, time past, lately. That is a different period than the present day. Time passed, and you'll see that he, John Parkhurst emphasizes that it is in the very scriptures that we are talking about, 31, 29. John Parkhurst references the texts of Genesis 1934, chapter 31, verse 42, and 2 Kings 9, 26, in his definition of the word H570, a mush. Interestingly, these texts also show a context of a separate time frame other than when the speaking was done. Yes, Strong shows definitions also, yet they are not as clarifying. What does yester mean? This is taken from the online etymological. I'm just going to read the purple words. Originally, the other day reckoned from today either backward or forward do you note that there has been a division in the comparison here the other day it is not this day it is the other day so there has been a division once again note that the other day strongly indicates a 24-hour period separate from the existing one Yesternight will reflect this meaning in realizing the previous 24-hour period other than which is spoken on the present one. Yesternight, here's another definition. In American English, it says it's a noun, it's an adverb, and yes, they do say it is archaic. <laughs> on the night before today. Again, in the words, we see that division. It is a separate 24-hour period. Last night. Why do we say today and tonight? Are those not inclusive, but not yesternight? 
Yesternight is exclusive. There is a big difference, huge, massive, very, very important. Yester does not support an inclusive meaning. Yester indicates having been distinguished as separate. Yester is very separate. Where is the cycle separator? As you see, it is the dawn. That is what separates the previous day from the next day. The dawn terminates the previous and initiates the start of the new day. So let's read this verse again, Genesis 31, 29. It is in the power of my hand to do evil to you, but the Elohim of your father spoke to me. When? Yesternight. Laban spoke to Yaakov on this present light season. This night season was a different and previous weekly cycle. This is the night that Yahuwah gave a dream to Laban, and it was not the same day. The, sep the sunset did not change the day in this event. What divine institution separated, divided, and distinguished these two different cycles of the week? Have we realized right from creation week that the dawn was and still is the separating point of reckoning, according to Yahuwah? And the consensus is, Yahuwah provided the bulker, that's or the dawn, at creation for determining the cycles of the week. This 24-hour cycle was finished at the point of the first light above the dark horizon. Dawn brings the light of the next cycle. On the former night season, which was the previous 24-hour cycle, Yahuwah issued protection for Yaakov in the form of a dream. Recall this protection. Chapter 31, verse 2. And I am with you. That is the protection. That is his promise. He will be there. So let's look at more of this protection that is coming up. But let's look at Laban here first. What was Laban's major darkness? And now you have gone because you greatly long for your father's house. But why did you steal my mighty ones? Yaakov consequently declares this. With whomever you find your mighty ones, do not let him live. In the presence of our brothers, see for yourself what is with me and take it with you. For Yaakov did not know that Rachel had stolen them. Laban was incensed that his gods had been removed from his house. Worshipping pagan gods and graven images was Laban's evil darkness, and he desperately wanted them back. Interestingly, Laban did have a certain level of respect for his daughter, Rachel. When she declared her situation as that of the monthly time of a lady, Laban did not force her to stand up. Whether this time was the truth or not, we do not know. Once again, Yahuwah protected Yaakov from severe grief. What if Rachel had have stood up and those images had have been beneath her? What would Laban have done? We can only surmise at this point. But there could have been absolute incredible severe grief at that point. Yahuwah, with his promise, and I am with you, protected Yaakov from this event. He protected Rachel also. Yahuwah is in the business of bringing forth good results out of many very awkward situations. In verse 36 to 41, the intense feelings between Laban and Yaakov were voiced passionately. Let's examine verse 42. Yaakov speaks a second witness. It is a confirmation. 
If we look down on the bottom, we'll see in the pink bar there, this is Creations Boker. And it is the daily belt buckle. It comes once a day. It is the dawn divider. It separates and it divides. Yaakov concludes his defense towards Laban in this late season. Let's read it. Unless the Elohim of my father, the Elohim of Abram, and the fear of Yitzhak had been with me, you would now have sent me away empty-handed. Elohim has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rendered judgment. When? Last night. That word is amash. It's been translated to us as yesternight. It is the night before, the night of Laban's dream. And it was separated and it was divided by the dawn. That is Yahuwah's division point for the daily cycles. Yaakov's witness confirms Genesis 1, and it is very noteworthy. Yaakov did not consider the previous night season as integral with the light season of high contention dialogue with Laban. Yaakov spoke of the dream night as being separated and divided by the Boker dawn light, and that is exactly as Yahuwah stipulated at creation. The light season of contentious conversation was separated from the dream night by the dawn. So we're looking at the Hebrew words here, and the Hebrew words are proving dawn to dawn days. And this is another confirmation. Laban, recalling Yahuwah's command in the dream, decides to lead out and diffuse the situation. Genesis thirty-one forty-three. And Laban answered and said to Yaakov, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and this flock is my flock, and all that you see is mine. But what shall I do today to these my daughters, or to their children, whom they have borne? Now we are coming to an extremely important portion of this event. We need to pay attention to this. The covenant. The four scriptural components of an everlasting covenant. Number one is the proposal that must lead out. After the proposal comes the acceptance. Whether it's accepted or not, that acceptance is number two. The anointing, blood sacrifice. And this is part of an ancient suzerain treaty. They must have a blood sacrifice. And number four, they cannot be without this. There must be a sealing meal together. Genesis 31, 44. And now, come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and it shall be a witness between you and me. Make. This is just a, a normal English word. You can make a cake, you make a loaf of bread. You can make your bed. What is with this word? What does make a covenant mean? If we just look at the English, you know, just make a covenant. Very easy. Made, done, move on. But what about the Hebrew? What does this word make mean? We're going to look at this. The first scriptural component of their covenant, the proposal, and we'll see that in verse 44. And now, come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and it shall be a witness between you and me. Is this just a promise with each other? You say, okay, we're not going to hurt each other, and we shake our hands and go, the, say, or go each other's way? Is it just a, a verbal agreement? Yeah, we're going to be friends and brothers from now on? Or is this a covenant? Note that even Laban recognized the authority of the ancient suzerain treaty system of that era. This is the same type of agreement that Yahuwah met Abram with on his level, because Abram also recognized the absolute authority of the ancient suzerain treaty of his time. 
The second scriptural component of their covenant, the acceptance. Genesis 31, 45. So Yaakov took a stone and set it up as a standing column. Yaakov recalled the words of Yahuwah, and I am with you, and he immediately accepted Laban's proposal because he knew that Yahuwah was with him and working for him. He recognized it clearly. Genesis 31, 46. And Yaakov said to his brothers, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. Now, I want you to see this picture that has been painted here by Sabina from Germany. We asked her to paint a, a picture according to these verses, and I think she did an absolute smashing job. And I want to thank Sabina for con contributing to this PowerPoint. There's a bigger version of this picture. Well done, Sabina. Thank you. Yaakov wrestled with Yahusha. We see that in Genesis 28. And after which he made a vow. And then he raised a commemorative stone and anointed it. Once again, on account of the covenant, Yaakov raised up a stone column to permanently witness the blood covenant event and location with Laban. Was this important? Absolutely. This is what they did for a covenant. They raised a monument so that it could stand for maybe not forever, but for a very, very long time. Yaakov immediately accepted the proposal from Laban, and he raised up a stone. We will be returning to the last part of verse 46 soon, but we need to look at the narration of this event first. Verse 47, and Laban called it Yagar Sahadutha, but Yaakov called it Galed. And Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. That is why the name was called Galed. And this is from Jesenius's lexicon. If we look at this word, Galed, Gimel Lamed Ayin Dalet, you will see that it means hill of witness. Very appropriately named, Galed. This was that heap of stones that they put around the one stone that was raised up. Verse 48b, this is why its name was called Galed, and also Mitzpah, because he said, let Yahuwah watch between you and me when we are out of each other's sight. And you follow this down with that arrow, and you'll see in the Hebrew lexicon by W.H. Barker from 1776, it means watching or watchtower. Interesting. Watchtower, that's what, that's what Yaakov raised up. He raised up stone to indicate this. Let Yahuwah watch between me and you. Have you noticed that even though Laban worshipped graven images, in this verse, and I do say in this verse because it's going to be different from other verses, in this verse, he consented full authority to Yahuwah in observing the future interactions between him and Yaakov. Can this picture be summarized as syncretism by Laban? Because we know that Laban worshipped pagan gods. He had them, he wanted them back. Is this syncretism by Laban? Is there more evidence of syncretism, paganism, and some divinity? We know what Yahuwah thinks of syncretism. Laban defines more covenant details between him and Yaakov. If you afflict my daughters, or if you take other wives besides my daughters, although no man is with us, see, Elohim is witness between you and me. And Laban said to Yaakov, see this heap and this standing column which I have placed between you and me? This heap is a witness, and this standing column is a witness, that I do not pass beyond this heap to you, and you do not pass beyond this heap and this standing column to me 
for evil. This is the details of the covenant. Laban speaks his final covenant statement. The Elohim of Abraham. We know who that is. The Elohim of Nahor. We know who that is. And the Elohim of their father. Who is their father? If you look on the right on the chart, you'll see that Pira is their father. So why does Laban say the Elohim of their father rightly rule between us? And what happens next? And Yaakov, by the fear of his father, Yitzhak, that was his vow, his emphasis, Yaakov clarified his oath by the Elohim, that is Yahuwah, of his father Isaac, so there could be no mistake upon whom his allegiance was given. He was clearing the air with Yahuwah. Here Laban divided authority on Yahuwah alongside the no gods associated with Terah to be the watchman between these two men forming their covenant. But why Terah? Recall that Tira was a vendor of graven images. So in this verse, do we once again see syncretism by Laban? He was being inclusive of all of the no-gods with Yahuwah. Syncretism. And what of the covenant being formed? Is there more? We have seen the first components. What is the third? The anointing, a blood sacrifice. Let's read it, Genesis 31, 54. And Yaakov brought an offering on the mountain. Once again, this is an ancient suzerain-type treaty, which has the four components identical to the one Yahuwah commanded to Abram. Yahuwah integrated the ultimate type of authority, which Abram recognized at that time. Yahuwah met Abram where he was at psychologically. This blood covenant between Laban and Yaakov was no different. It was the exact same type of ancient suzerain type treaty. The anointing, a blood sacrifice. Verse 54a, and Yaakov brought an offering on the mountain. This sacrifice was also divided into two halves. The two men were required by the type of official treaty that it was to walk between the two halves of the blood sacrifice. This treaty also had a death penalty for the one who chose to violate the treaty. How do we know this sacrifice was split? the same as Yahuwah's covenant as given to Abram? Do you see this information in the English language when you read it? What are we missing when we don't dig deeper? Let's look at this covenant between Yahuwah and Abram when Yahuwah gave the covenant to Abram. What is the word there? The word is H. 3772 karat and it is he cut literally to cut let's look at that word in jesenius we have information here karat to cut to cut off so used from slaying and dividing the victims as was customary in making a covenant Dividing the victims, customary in making a covenant. That's the word that was used in the covenant as given to Abram. What about this one with Laban and Yaakov? Let's look at this. Laban spoke. Now, come, let us what? Karat, H, th- H 3772. But in the English, we just read, let us make. Is there a difference? Is there a much deeper meaning to this? 
why do we just stick with the English? Let's dig into the Hebrew language. Let's look at it. Get out your lexicons, dig it apart, cut it and see what the base foundation of this information of this message is. That's the difference between reading and studying. I'm going to start again. And now come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and it shall be a witness between you and me. This sacrifice was to be divided in half to facilitate the two men passing between the two halves. Karat, we shall cut. We see the same word, 3772, karat, being used in this covenant, the four identical, sorry, the four identical components recorded and the full authority given to Yahuwah by Yaakov. This pattern clearly shows this covenant was split and contained the death penalty for the one who broke it. We have seen three of these scriptural components. There was the proposal set forth by Laban. There was the acceptance by Yaakov. He risked stones and they made a heap around it for a monument to mark it. And Yaakov brought the anointing that is a blood sacrifice. That is the serious, most serious part of the covenant. But there is a fourth portion that must be performed. It cannot be missed. It, mu it is integral with the ancient suzerain type treaty. Number four, the meal of confirmation. For the segment, this fourth segment, we must view the last part of Genesis 31, 46 for the first witness of component number four. Yes, first witness because there is two. Genesis 31, 46. And Yaakov said to his brothers, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap and they ate there on the heap they ate would that be the meal of confirmation as in the covenant with abram there was also a sealing meal here what about the second meal witness of laban and yaakov verse 54 and yaakov brought an offering on the mountain and called his brothers to eat bread and they ate bread and spent the night on the mountain they ate bread this is our fourth component of the ancient suzerain covenant abram had one laban and yaakov had one and the next major one would be at mount sinai yet abram's covenant had a 400 year timeline we see that written in Genesis 15 13 and it was built within the covenant it was spoken by yahuwah until the meal of confirmation was eaten at the Passover in Mitzrayim. <laughs> now, the covenant investigation between Laban and Yaakov has been completed. They offered or they ate their meal. They confirmed this covenant. But what about the other topic that originally started this investigation? What about dawn to dawn do we have more witnesses on dawn to dawn here we look at this this covenant or look look at the event i should say on the left you'll see dawn this is the light season where laban furiously chased yaakov that night season came along this is the night season where yahuwah gave a stern warning in a dream to Laban. The dawn comes along, and that brings the next 24 hour cycle. When was the dream that was given to Laban? It was yesternight, Emesh, the previous 24 hour period. It was accepted by the dawn, Yahuwah. Yaakov and Laban hashed out the heated contentions and a decision is made to cut a covenant of peace. If components were recorded, the sealing meal is eaten. And they stayed the night 
on the mountain. And Yaakov brought an offering on the mountain, and they called his brothers to eat, and they ate bread and spent the night on the mountain. The Hebrew words do not indicate in any way, shape, or form of a separation between this light season and the night season that they spent on the mountain. There is no separation. It is not seen the Hebrew word set did not change the day here. Yaakov and Laban camp out on the mountain. When did Laban arise to leave? What words are we going to see here? And Laban rose up early in the morning and kissed his sons and daughters and blessed them. And Laban left and returned to his place. He Not is good. rising. He is rising early very early in the morning. We see that in Genesis 31, 55. We know that when Moshe arose early to converse with Pharaoh, it was Boker at the break of dawn. What about, what about Laban's timing? Is it the same? There is the Hebrew word, Boker. That is when Laban arose. He arose in the morning. It was early in the morning, Boker. We know that that indicates the dawn, the first light of the 24-hour period. What does Boker indicate? And what are the definitions? There again is the Hebrew lexicon by John Parkhurst from 1762. And his definition of Boker is, well, I should say one of his definitions <laughs> is to break forth as the light through darkness to break forth. That is your very first light that comes above the dark horizon. That is the beginning of your day. That is the beginning of your Shabbat. And the beginning of the day, we see that when Yaakov wrestled with Yahusha, a very clear testament to the beginning of the day at dawn. At what point? does the light break forth through the darkness of the night? Are there other definitions that describe dawn? From Jesenius, the word boker, morning, daybreak, dawn, even before light, so-called from the breaking forth of light. That is when Yahuwah starts his, his 24-hour cycles at dawn, at the breaking forth of light. And remember when Yahushua's mercy renews itself? Every dawn, his mercy renewed. Praise Yahuwah for that. Boker, to cleave. This is other definitions. And it gives you the indication of or a description of what happens with this word. To cleave, to divide, to lay open. The notion of clean, laying open is in this root transferred to signify, number one, to cleave the soil, to plow. What does a plow have to do with boker? I thought we were talking about light. Well, this is the action. The boker is, is giving us the action which happens. <laughs> number two. To burst forth, to break forth as light. See, here we're speaking about the light. Hence, boker, morning. So this word boker gives us the action. It, it describes what happens. When we apply the action to light, it bursts forth and it breaks forth at dawn in the morning. Can we see that the boker means to divide, separate, split apart, and lay open as in distinguishing different identities? The dawn period of the 24-hour cycle is the only 24-hour portion that contains these definitions. I'm going to read this again. The dawn period of the 24-hour cycle is the only 24-hour portion that contains these definitions. There is no other division information on the other portions of the 24-hour cycle. It does not exist in the Hebrew words. 
the dawn is like a belt buckle. The 24-hour cycle fulfills a complete circuit and then is split apart by the ox pulling a plow. Again, what does an ox pulling a plow have to do with Boker? There we see a picture of dawn's light breaking forth. Dawn is likened to an ox and plow. Look at that picture down there. One side is completed. You see the dirt's turned over. It's been plowed. It's changed. It is a different entity than the other side. That next portion is to be conquered. It is a future portion. The portion where you see the dirt is the past. It has been worked already. It is split. It is divided apart. That oxen plow have created the action of Boker, a division, separate and divide. So when you apply that to light, we see that it is a cleaving. It is a setting, a setting apart, a division. And it is here in the definitions we see as used for plowing, cleaving, glaring with a plow. Oh, I'm going to back this up a little bit. I want to tell you that I took this picture here about a month ago at my work. The, the, the sky, this before suns or before sunrise, this light was breaking forth. It was an absolute fire in the sky. It was absolutely beautiful. This is dawn. This is before sunrise. This is not the very beginning of it, but is well into the twilight before sunrise. What part of dawn or poker have we missed in the last 2,700 years? Why do I say 2,700 years? Because that is approximately when the sunset to sunset teachings came into fruition. We have been taught and coerced into believing, I should say, and deceived into believing that the sunset change the days not according to yahuwah they do not not according to scriptures the sunset has shown uh, at least a very minimum of 36 times in the scripture where it has failed to change the day of any kind and i ask you how many times can the sunset fail before we suspect it is not correct it's time for us to open our eyes to the words of the scriptures. Who taught us that the boker had no importance or the dawn? Who was that? Who removed the dawn from timing? Remember Yahushua's words. You have removed the key of knowledge. If that boker or the dawn has been removed... And we are observing our Shabbats on a different schedule. To whom are we giving our allegiance? It's not to Yahuwah. You have removed the key of knowledge. That is important. Yaakov and Laban's contentious day, which turned into a covenant of peace, started at dawn. For the ensuing night season of camping on the mount, there are no Hebrew words that indicate in any way, shape, or form of a separation action. There are no Hebrew definitions that would distinguish the night season as on a separate 24-hour period from the, light, from the light season. Laban arose at Boker, or dawn, the break of the day where there are many various evidences and equal examples, and you can read that also in Genesis 32, 24, 26, and 31, and at the very beginning of the new cycle of the week, this is when Laban rose to begin his journey home at dawn, the beginning of a new 24-hour cycle. This is the end of this short little study. I hope you have seen the importance of looking into the Hebrew words and digging them up and dividing them up, going through them and applying them to the scriptures. I also hope that you see 
that the sunset failed to change the day in this event, as with many others. And I hope you're able to see that the dawn to dawn is the way that we should be observing Yahuwah's Shabbat and these his feasts. May Yahuwah bless, guide, and give you wisdom and understanding to set up your pillars for him. And if you have any questions, send them along. We'll be happy to hear from you. Thank you for joining me this Shabbat. May you be blessed greatly.